traditional invitation for a Dhamma talk, and now I'll begin with a homage to the Triple Gem, and usually just the speaker does this. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami So who here has read the book, The Five Love Languages? Anyone? All right, a few hands. Um, so I remember talking to my friends in recent years as they were all getting married, and they kept, or some of them spoke about this book written by a man named Gary Chapman about finding your love language. And these include uh, such things as giving gifts, receiving help, kind words, quality time, and uh, physical touch. And with the exception of the phys physical touch part, uh, I remember speaking with Ajahn Kovilo a few years ago and realizing that more and more marriage advice had a lot of bearing on monastic life and relationships between monks as well. So figuring out how we make the other, you know, node in a relationship feel uh, acknowledged, cared for, heard. And what's interesting about these love languages is there's an almost exact parallel in one of the suttas called uh, the powers. It's in the Anguttara Nikaya's uh, 9.5. And in it, the Buddha speaks about five qualities one cultivates in order to preserve harmony. These include giving gifts, danang, kind words, pia vacha, uh, sort of quality, time, benevolent conduct, um, atacharya, and consistency, uh, samanatata. And I don't know whether Gary Chapman was Buddhist, but he certainly got most of these uh, at least right in terms of the Buddhist conception of what preserves harmony and the ways we can uh, feel safe and acknowledged. And what I found interesting recently was realizing that each of these love languages, or what are called the Sangha Vatu in Buddhist uh, circles. Each of these Sangha Vatu is meaningful to us because it addresses a need and a fear we hold deepest. So if we say our love language, our Sangha Vatu, uh, our chief need as an individual is that of receiving uh, gifts. That's how we feel cared for. Then the need, the fear that underlies it is the fear of scarcity, of not having enough. If our chief love language, Sangavatu, is kind words, then the deeper fear underlying it, not just in relationship to a single individual, but to the world as a whole, might be something like not being good enough, insufficient. If our love language, our Sangavatu, is the spending of quality time, atacharya, then benevolent conduct then, you know, or help. The deep fear underlying it might really be not being, uh, not being enough, not being able to meet the things we're supposed to meet to finish those duties which we feel we need to finish. 
And if our sanghavatu, our love language, is uh, the need for consistency, samanatata, then the fear it addresses might be thought of as the fear of things not being controlled enough, of chaos, of not being able to direct an experience and a life which feels so often as if it's tumbling out of bounds of our control. So in this way, we translate the love languages into uh, the loss languages. And I think it's very important for each of us to figure out what our language of loss is, because each of us has one, the thing that eats at us the most, the thread of dukkha, how it manifests in our lives that constantly uh, unravels us and comes up again and again and again. And uh, I think these actually sometimes are very visible to us and to those around us. Perhaps, um, you know, recently uh, someone um, I know had a uh, just enormous remodeling to the um, septic system. And this was useful for me as a uh, possible future inheritor of a septic system at a monastery is to know like septic systems are, they're intense. <laughs> so, but to realize how difficult it was to have the house and the yard in tatters, this sort of utter chaos and what that can do um, when it really unravels a particular loss language for us. What it means for our loss language to be uh, that of needing kind words and how we can fight our whole lives for acknowledgement, um, for praise. And this can be the driving force of a life, the fear of scarcity and the need to accumulate and constantly worry about this. And the love language and loss language of uh, help and of not being able to do enough, not being able to do all we are supposed to, and the constant feeling of overwhelm, what it means to be driven by that. So if we learn our loss language, what we have an opportunity to do is to lean into it and speak to the world through it as a love language of our own back into the world. Each of these is fear of lack. And in Buddhist thought, the root to wealth, to plenty, is not accumulation, but rather making one's needs more minimal, when one's wants less, and particularly to give, because the act of giving is the most concrete and bold acknowledgement that we have more than we need. It's an acknowledgement of wealth. And this is very relevant as a monk. You know, you go to Thailand to these small villages and uh, go for alms every morning. And there are, you know, rubber plantation workers. There are uh, people who are barely scraping by. And here you come from an upper middle class life in the West, and they're giving you rice. And how do you um, square yourself with that fact? And it took me a time to realize, you know, first of all, they're not giving to me. It's an acknowledgement of uh, their veneration for this sangha and this teaching. But also, it's the most powerful way of having, for a moment, this power dynamic completely reversed, where in a culture that so fetishizes the West, 
suddenly they see someone who's acknowledged that all of that was worth giving up for what they in this Buddhist country have held so close to their heart for this teaching. And it's not them coming in askance to the, you know, feet of a first class nation, but rather they're giving to you. And not only are in that moment acknowledging a wealth enough, but it's a validation of so much that that culture has held so precious. And in that, I think the most powerful route in Buddhism to letting go of these fears, to letting go of scarcity is to give and acknowledge our wealth. And so to address each of these lacks, whatever our loss language is, we move into it by giving and embodying an ethic of plenty. So if our loss language is, or our love language is receiving gifts, and our loss language might be one of worry of scarcity, of not having enough, then can we really take on the practice of speaking to the world in the language of giving? There's an, uh, this is the first paramita, the spiritual perfection, and it's one that in the West we so often skip over in our uh, enthusiasm for meditation practice, and yet it's robust, it holds the entire practice, it brightens the heart, it's the beginning of the graduated teaching the Buddha gave before anything else, giving dana. And in Sri Lanka, there's a practice they take on where uh, they won't eat until they have given. And this is difficult for breakfast, but you can do it for dinner. And I know my parents have taken this on for a time. Um, I know many people who have, and it's transformative. There's always someone you can give to, a plate of cookies to a neighbor, a cup of soup to some someone who's homeless. Uh, my uh, father took this on for a time and just had story after story almost every day of coming down the hill in Spokane and seeing you know someone out in the cold and just handing them a cup of soup and they'd often break into tears. There is so much opportunity, infinite opportunities to give in our lives and we pass over so many without knowing. The other useful uh, path here is to forgiving is the Buddha gave seven in the Anguttara Nikayas, the numerical discourse, as he spoke of seven reasons to give, and they move in ascending order of refinement. So one gives because, because one thinks this will come back to me as good karma. That's the most coarse. Then one gives because they think giving is good. Then they give because they think this person has less than me. Then they give because they think my parents and grandparents gave. How could I stop? They give because they think of it as a sacrifice. Um, they give, I'm missing one, but they give as an ornament, sorry, to calm the mind and to bring about serenity. And finally, they give as an ornament of the mind. So I think we all wish we could constantly be giving from those truly altruistic intentions at number six and seven. But despite the fact that number seven's pretty much just available to enlightened beings, um, Sometimes we have to rely on the most coarse, uh, the most basic admonition of why we give, thinking that it might come back to us. And this can actually help. If you're worried about uh, giving a gift that you care about, really consider that through that giving, so often those things do come right back to you. It's not lost. And the Buddha said that when the house is on fire, this is in the numerical discourses, when a house is on fire, the vessel salvaged will be the one of use. And so when this world is on fire with aging and death, that which is given is what is salvaged. One salvages one's wealth by giving. So if you just need that extra push to give, this is a good thing to remember is you're not losing it. And 
often what I find is even though that sounds like a mean motivation, once the act of giving has taken place, it's so beautiful, it overwhelms any taint of intention. Point is, you use every re resource you can to make yourself give the big apple. My, uh, I lived with a monk named uh, Tanpanya in Australia, one of the nicest monks I've ever known. And his sister um, was bringing this big coffee maker for the monastery in her, uh, her carry-on. And she took a picture, and it was just, like, brutally big. Like, I don't, it was obviously this huge thing for her to carry. And the reflection was, it's, it's not Donna unless it hurts a little bit, or the best Donna hurts a little bit. And I find that a useful acknowledgement that if things are a little bit difficult to give, often that's uh, an acknowledgement that it's an extra powerful effacement and polishing of the heart. The other thing is that if we want an object badly, um, Tanpanya would do this as well, is he'd really want to, you know, make himself a cocoa or something. And he would consciously make himself give the thing he wanted. And this is really useful because often we don't have the ability to cut off a desire because the object already has a valence, a charge. But what we can do is reverse the charge and give it away instead. This monk was absurdly nice. I, uh, once we, <laughs> we, I, I, we had some dark chocolate and I think I like ate too much. And he came to me and he's like, Nisipo, I'm just so grateful. I know you knew that I had problems with my greed and eating too much chocolate. And I saw that you, you ate that chocolate to keep me from you know, indulging, and I'm just so impressed with that, and I'm like, <laughs> all right, <laughs> so that's kindness. But this is how we create an ethic of wealth. We give with our lost language. And if our lost language is, or our love language, is kind words, pia vacha, and our lost language is associated with that as worrying we're not good enough, then can we really work to cultivate humility? And uh, I was reading an Epictetus quote. Um, he's a Greek philosopher this morning. And it said that if someone comes to you and speaks about how another was slandering you, you should not defend yourself, but rather say, if he had known all my faults, he wouldn't have said just these. He would have said far more than that. I really like that. And there's a sutta in the numerical discourse, it's called the Saparisa Sutta, where the Buddha says, a true person, when asked about one's good qualities, responds briefly, not in detail. Or no, says little. If pressed, if asked more, if pressed with questions, they respond just briefly with omissions. A true person, when asked about their bad qualities, will say, will speak in detail. A true person, when asked about another's bad qualities, will say little. If pressed, if pressed with questions, they will speak only a little bit with omissions. If a true person is asked about another's good qualities, they will speak at length in detail. So this ethic of humility of doing good and not asking for acknowledgement, of forcing oneself to do good in quiet and having faith that that brightening of the spirit is visible of its own accord. It's a very powerful practice. And I know someone who at a monastery, they had a goal of doing one uh, anonymous, unspoken of act of kindness every day. I think that's a good practice. If our lost language and our love language is help and our lost language is the associated fear of 
not being enough, not being able to meet the demands which are placed on us, then moving into that loss, that fear, with the same ethic of plenty and of giving as a cure, as an acknowledgement of our own wealth of time and ability, is a powerful way to approach the world. So to do this, one can um, make a practice of putting in one's schedule time every day to do something for someone else and only for someone else, whether that be one's partner. And what you find is once it's done, you don't feel like you've lost time. There are certain activities which create time and certain activities which drain it, the trivial and the non-trivial. And David Stendhal Rost said that the cure to exhaustion is not rest, but wholeheartedness. So can you do that which brightens the spirit and think and know that by doing so, you do not lose time, you gain. You do have enough energy. And this isn't to say you do everything that's asked of you. Um, you go to every invitation. You are careful of your time. But making space to listen to others, to take time for others' tasks, to help is uh, an important thing and can address this in a direct way. And the final love language of consistency, of, you know, quality time, samanatata, and the associated loss language of being out of control, of not having enough um, control over the whirling conditions that surround us. To move into that and to address it by cultivating an ethic of surrender at times. I mean, there are a few ways. It's such a deep-rooted fear, deeply associated with our uh, encounter with the aspect of impermanent, or impermanence, anicca. But one can, first of all, this is the reason why monastics can't touch money and why we cannot ask for anything unless offered is because what the Buddha did is create an institution that is completely dependent on the world and on the Dharma rising to meet you. And it shouldn't work, and it does. Um, the world does rise, and we have a practice called Tudong or Dutanga, where you wander uh, just sleeping on the side of the road and eating what's given to you. And I've done it a few times in the West. One time comes to mind, I did it from LA to Watmeta over about 10 days um, and was on a Greyhound and the Greyhound just dropped me off at the wrong city. And they were like, it's fine. It's just a $5 bus ticket to where you need to go. And I said, I don't have $5. So I guess that's two days of walking. And the moment I got off the bus into that wrong town, um, someone they had about 10 minutes left before the midday uh, cutoff point for eating. And this person came out of nowhere with a whole meal uh, just right when I got off the bus. And it was kind of the universe's way, I felt, of just welcoming you into this realm of uncertainty. The first man I talked to was a war veteran who was waiting for a homeless friend of his who'd been a veteran too, and just to give him some guidance. And he said, you know, I don't know where he is, but he'll come on God's time, not Anthony's time. And surrendering oneself to this other time, to an agenda not our own and trusting it, and sometimes it really takes a complete surrender to feel that at work. Uh, over the subsequent days of that trip, I was given uh, so many acts of generosity. And you know, some days you were sleeping on the side of the road. 
but um, then people would take you in, they would uh, give to you. I mean, this is what we do on alms round every day is depend on the unsolicited generosity of strangers. And the first day I went to Pike Place Market, um, seven people gave spontaneously. It helped when I got a baguette because they stick out of the bowl and then people realize it's not a drum, so that helps. <laughs> but the world does rise to meet you if you're walking in line with the Dhamma. Another useful thing with this worry about control is to notice that as the field of our action expands, and I really found this as a monk stepping into the world of board dynamics and 501c3s, it's just too many variables to keep track of and you become overwhelmed with doubt. And what I realized in the end is that as the seas get higher and more turbulent, you ironically or counterintuitively have to pay all the more attention just to your hand on the rudder. The wider the field, the more narrow your focus in the sense of on your heart. It's as if when the seas are calm, you can look out quite far and see the horizon. But when the seas get rough and the next wave obscures everything, all you can do is make sure you're steering correctly into that huge swell. And so I find, found time and again that when deciding how to you know, work with uh, a board or um, a document or some element of Clear Mountain, I couldn't decide from a wide vantage point. What you had to come back to again and again is how does this feel in my heart right now? And this acknowledgement of an utter lack of control of external circumstance, but a deep and meaningful control over the one element you have, which is this sense of brightness of heart, of solidity. And you can feel in almost every action what the courageous choice is and what the weak one is. The weak one has the feeling of disintegrating, of weakening. You can usually hear its voice if you listen to its tone of voice. Mara has a particular tone of voice. It's kind of oily. Whereas the Buddha's voice is very like, it's not the actual Buddha, but the wholesome voice is solid, even if it's telling you to do something urgently, like get out now. You know the tone of those voices. Another thing you can do is uh, imagine both decision points ahead of you and turn your body towards either and see which way the body reacts to one or the other. And if you end up making the wrong decision, um, at least you made the one which felt strong and courageous and dhammic from the very beginning. So this is a way of working with lack of control and fear of that, is coming back to that which we have meaningful control over. And really having faith. One of the most, um, that when we walk on this path, things will click into place and follow as they're supposed to. One of the most meaningful stories I read of in recent history was that of, uh, if those of you who've read about the fall of the Roman Republic, it was the greatest uh, kind of conspiracy of all time. It's, uh, there was what was called the triumvirate of Caesar, who is this brilliant politician, Pompey, the most esteemed general of the time, and Crassus, who was the richest man in Rome. And together they brought down the Republic. And uh, Caesar is equivalent to delusion. Um, he's just, he was an absolute genius. Pompey, aversion. He was the war general. And Crassus to greed, the most wealthy man. And together, they were almost unbeatable. And initially, Caesar was the sort of little one in the trio. And soon, he uh, attained ultimate power, just like delusion grows. And against this enormous triumvirate was poised one man, whose name was Cato, and he didn't have a lot going for him, except that he was absurdly honest, always, um, to his own detriment. And people would say of Cato, he thinks he walks in the streets of Plato's Republic when he walks in the sewers of Rome. But through no more than his unerring honesty, um, he more or less held off the triumvirate for years, and he's the one who we remember in history. 
So just this, this acknowledgement that I think one of his quotes was, when times are dare, when times are corrupt and bad men rule, the station of virtue is a lonely station. Be content to be good on your own. And I find we don't find ourselves in that situation in the sense we're surrounded by other good people. And this is the beauty of coming together. But to know that whatever beauty and brightness you cultivate through this practice travels on and holds you. And this is the one thing we have control over and it's the most meaningful thing. And it will hold us. So I think this is how we work with that lost language. So in your marriages and your uh, interactions with the world, I wish you all the best with these. Okay, I think we have time for some questions and things people would like to discuss if we have any topics. And if you're on the live stream, you can type in uh, things you'd like to ask or raise your hand if you're on the Zoom. Oh, and actually we have a mic runner who will come and give you the mic if that's right. The people on Zoom want to hear you too, Jeff. Here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just the Zoom, the Zoom people. I'm Jeff Tucker. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about going back to giving, um, the importance of giving to animals, our pets or domestic animals, but also the smaller wild animals that might come around our homes and visit some food or water or shelter, or even the gardener who gives loving kindness and care to the plants. That's a great question. I think we overlook the power of the Buddhist teaching in that it was one of the first to really acknowledge the breadth of loving kindness to extend to all animals. I mean, that's something that just was kind of unheard of and for many millennia afterwards was unheard of in many part of the, parts of the world. So the Buddha said um, to the monks that when we throw out the scraps from our bowls, uh, we should think um, that we're giving them to the little animals that are around the piece of grass where we throw those few grains of rice. And doing so brings merit and happiness and goodness. So he acknowledged that explicitly. And I lived with a really amazing monk named Ajahn Tong who would frequently, he'd take little bits of bread after his uh, meal and he'd just kneel by the ants and just feed these lines of ants his pieces of bread and his metta was so strong. Um, the monks released a tortoise in the monastery once, and it just wandered right up to his kuti and just stood in front of his door for like hours just waiting for him. So giving to animals uh, is, yeah, an amazing act of giving and, uh, and, and deeply meaningful. Um, yeah, I, I'd say that that's a powerful way of giving, and one should cultivate it. Ajahn Chah would... Uh, frequently let animals and deer would just come up to him and eat from his hand. They really sense that sort of loving kindness. <laughs>